my name is Adrian Blackwell. I'm an assistant professor here at the School of Architecture. Um, and it's a pleasure for me to introduce to you uh, Bridget Shim and Howard Sutcliffe. Um, I did not know Bridget and Howard when they were students here, but I did get to meet them shortly thereafter. I had the pleasure of studying with Bridget in the, I think, the 3A large building studio um, here at Waterloo. And um, around that same time, I met um, Howard at KPMB Architects, where um, he was a, a mentor with a wonderful sense of humor, um, teaching me how to make it through the day with a horrible hangover um, from his <laughs> special knowledge from his days at Ron Tom Architect. Um, so since 1994, when Bridget and Howard officially started their firm, I've watched them build a practice based on small but perfectly executed projects, initially made mostly for private clients, into one of the most important architectural practices in Canada, designing a full range of buildings for public and private institutions and spaces. Shim Sutcliffe has won an unprecedented, I think, 14 Governor General's Awards in Architecture, maybe, maybe that's even wrong as they keep getting, that number keeps getting larger, an American Institute of Architects Honor Award, and in 2013 they received the Honor, the Order of Canada. One of the keys to their success is that they've kept their practice at a scale so they can be personally involved in all the design decisions. And as you probably know, they like to make decisions, a lot of those decisions, about all the details of a project, from the curtains to the curtain wall, from the furniture to the lighting, elements that most architects today are happy to specify from a catalog. In this sense, Bridget and Howard have remained true to the conception of an architect as someone who has a vision about everything about the building and even the landscape. They make buildings from scratch. This vision that crosses disciplines and scales is constantly surprising, constantly inventive and original. And yet, it also illustrates the development of a very particular set of concerns um, that, are, that are rooted in local landscapes, typologies and cultures, as well as in the histories of modern architecture in a global context. This thoughtful approach to architecture is informed by Bridget's impressive career as a professor of architecture at the University of Toronto, where she's initiated research on important questions of architectural typology and urbanism, such as the laneway study that um, she did a number of years ago. We're very lucky that the two, of, um, the two of our most celebrated graduates have agreed to speak to us tonight on the occasion of the launch of our 50th anniversary um, year. Um, please welcome Bridget Shim and Howard Sutcliffe. Uh, so, first of all, I'm going to do the lecture, and Howard will do the question and answers. <laughs> we, drew, we drew straws, and here, this is how it goes. Um, uh, so, first of all, what a wonderful dedication. I'm quite emotional still. Um, it was su such a kind of wonderful thing to hear um, both Bob Wilger, uh, Larry's uh, son, speak about uh, such an important person. Uh, so Howard and I are truly honored to really be the first to lecture in this room after it's been dedicated to uh, Dr. Uh, Lawrence Cummings. And in a way, what I wanted to do was to share our journey as uh, from students to graduates on this very special occasion of the 50th anniversary of the school. It's actually quite nerve-wracking for two people who tend to look forward with a certain degree of optimism uh, to give a lecture like this because these are really moments for reflection and sort of looking back simultaneously. We were two kids that went to public school, Howard and Ancaster. Uh, I went to public school in Willowdale and we were really fortunate to have selected the University of Waterloo, a young architecture school as a place to learn about our chosen discipline and we value and appreciate our education here at this university. So, uh, In a way, um, we're both Canadians because we were both born somewhere else, which makes us truly Canadian. Howard was born in Yorkshire, England, and he came to Canada when he was two on the QEW, on, a t on the QE2 on a terrible winter crossing. Um, I was born in Kingston, Jamaica, and arrived at the age of seven in the middle of a blizzard. So seeing snow for the first time and making snow angels was really a sign that I was in a new place. 
When U the University of Waterloo School of Architecture opened, Howard and I were both nine years old. And like the rest of the country, we were mesmerized by Expo 67. We each have vivid memories of attending Expo with our families. We rode on monorails through ex the Expo grounds, got off inside Bucky Fuller's geodesic dome, watched these amazing concrete houses in the sky stacked up like Lego blocks, creating remarkable in-between spaces. They called it habitat. And the opening of this school coincided with the coming of age of a young country that was also filled with a huge amount of optimism for the future and understanding through Expo the crucial role that architecture played within it. So in 1977, we both arrived at this Phillips Street studio beyond the edge of campus. We spent our time either in this provisional industrial building or tracking across the fields to the main campus where our lectures were held. This nondescript studio space had open web steel joists, steel columns, concrete floors, and it was a place where we spent a huge amount of time. The bleachers, which is an image in the lower, was actually where most of the crits took place and almost all of the informal gatherings. The students used the studios for indoor bike races in the winter and for quick oil changes in the summer with your pickup truck. Twice a day a coffee truck showed up with providing catering services and there was a sort of regular honk and you knew it was there. And this building was an unlikely place for such intense discussions about the interplay between architecture, urbanism, and society. Perhaps its relative isolation as an industrial building was kind of like an incubator off campus and coupled with intense co-op work terms in really urban settings all over the place created just the right balance uh, for school. One of our first foundation courses as students in architecture was actually with, with students in environmental studies, geography, and planning. Uh, this was taught by someone named Jakob Zvilna, and so the image in the lower middle is a sort of Zvilna drawing. And his lectures consisted of sharing his vision of the world, which included aligning mirror-like identical slides to create an even more delirious image. This is really hard with 35 millimeter uh, slides. He clearly was ahead of his time because in a way you can see him as an early metabolist or a precursor to parametric modeling using his Vilna blocks. Our class was so fortunate uh, and it's so great to see some of my classmates here, uh, Margaret Ishii and uh, Victoria Gregory, um, but we were so fortunate to be one of the first second year class studios taught by a young professor upper left named Rick Caldenby. And we were also fortunate to be the first third year class to be taught by another young professor, middle top, uh, Donald Mackay, along with uh, this amazing Finnish Japanophile named Fred Thompson, lower right. Anne Schrecker was the only female faculty we encountered as a studio professor during most of our time at Waterloo. And on the lower left is actually one of her books. So when we moved on campus, Larry Richards became the director of the school upper right, always with a warm and gracious smile, and he later became the dean at the University of Toronto School of Architecture, where he provided stellar leadership. Both Howard and I remember sitting in the green room at Phillips Street and hearing a lecture by Peter Cook with images of floating inflatable pigs being projected onto this extra large screen in this provisional space. It was mind-blowing and is still etched in my mind. Is this architecture? So later we could contextualize these images when you think about the work of Cedric Price, Fun Palace, but at the time it re required a recalibration of what this discipline of architecture was all about. In our first year, our studio projects consisted of making cardboard shelters that we slept in and kites and flying machines. The relationship between architecture and the city was a central aspect of the conversation when we were students at the Phillips Street Studio. We read Oppositions, Lotus, Casabella. At the time, the Institute for Architecture and Urbanism in New York was the meeting place for Europeans and North Americans committed to reshaping our cities. Aldo Rossi, and these are some of his images, uh, was a central figure who created buildings that were almost miniature cities 
and his writings were seminal to, to our understanding of the complex relationship between built form and urbanism. During our time at Waterloo, James Sterling was the, one of the most important architects. And having been a visiting chair for over a decade at Yale University School of Architecture, where James Terl Sterling taught, it was just an amazing model of an architect educator committed for most of his career to both dual activities. Sterling was really interesting because he rethought constructivism and its tectonic conditions, and he did this through a whole variety of academic buildings in England. But as a Brit, he was actually in a really important position because he entered several post-war competitions in Germany for Cologne, Dusseldorf, Stuttgart. These unbuilt competition entries, as well as his built work, Stuttgart on the upper left, really talks about the old and new being stitched together, a kind of important part of a kind of rebuilding of Germany at that time. So for my generation, Sterling's impact as an architect was profound. In preparing this lecture, one of the intern architects in our studio looked and said, so who is that guy? And they really did not know who James Sterling was, and they didn't know anything about his work. So times change. We're in this newly dedicated space to Dr. Lawrence Cummings. And iconography was really a cornerstone of our education at the School of Architecture. We did not learn history through chronology, but through ideas. We took courses with the poet Bob Wilger, who was so eloquent today in the dedication. And he used the work of Suzanne Langer to guide us through how to critique the work of others and in turn, our own work. Semblance, commanding form, the mark of a genuine myth were powerful ways of seeing the world and the creative process. So some of those words I would say still resonate for both Howard and I. We, we fundamentally believe that all architecture must have a strong conceptual starting point and that we work so hard to realize this into built form. The conversations and discussions through the iconography stream and with Professor Wilger and Dr. Cummings were seminal to our evolution into thinking architects who operate really at the scale of multiple scales, we think about furniture, landscape, as well as buildings, and we think about them really as artists who need to realize them in every single way, technical as well as uh, poetic. So Howard and I met in third year architecture. Donald Mackay asked our class to build a one to 10 model of several seminal works of architecture. We were assigned Tatlin's monument to the third international and I will share with you our secret weapon for allowing us to do a great job for Don Mackay. We combined model making with research skills to be able to realize the studio project through interlibrary loans, which you probably have never heard of. This is a pre-internet era. We found a catalog from the Musette Moderne in Stockholm, with image on the far left, which included archival photographs of Tatlin and his colleagues building the monument to the Third International. These construction process photos, the two on the right, revealed this amazing armature that they had created to realize this ambitious proposition. Being able to fully understand the role of this armature allowed us to build our model and to really accurately represent this tribute to the Third International. Howard and I both worked in Vancouver, Howard for Paul Merrick, upper left, and upper right is actually a tree house that he lived in in Vancouver. So amazing to be in one of his spaces that he lived in and to understand the kind of tectonic conditions of that space. I work for someone named Arthur Erickson, and his Laurel Street studio was really an amazing environment of wooden tree columns full of light. The studio had more female architects than I had ever encountered in my entire experience in architecture. And we felt very lucky to work for two important West Coast architects who shared their local condition through their, their knowledge, both of the local as well as these larger global issues. In a way, Rome um, is certainly one of Rick Haldenby's most significant accomplishments and another cornerstone of the school's curriculum. 
Rick championed this program and he willed it into existence. Generations of students have benefited from the experience of Rome, this remarkable construct, and the rich metropolitan life that goes on inside the buildings and outside in all of its public spaces. And in a way, I think all of the students in this school need to thank you for your vision and commitment to creating this amazing opportunity to experience Rome from the inside out. On a personal note, I actually never drank coffee for the entire four years I was in architecture school, but the minute I got to Rome, I experienced Cafe Tassadoro. It changed my life, <laughs> and, uh, and I became a coffee addict, and I am still one today. Uh, Howard and I were also fortunate to work with stellar architects. Upon graduating from Waterloo, Howard worked for Ron Tom for several years, then moved to Barton Myers. When Barton left Canada, the firm transitioned into KPMB. They were all remarkable mentors and have become um, good friends. My first job when I graduated was with Baird Sampson Architects. Barry and George were my first bosses. They also were mentors and now teaching colleagues and friends. I worked for George uh, researching aspects of his Space of Appearance book and also working in the office with both of them. Detlef Mertens and I taught together at the University of Waterloo and at the University of Toronto and was also a great friend and mentor. And in a way, these relationships really indicate that we are truly part of a rich and complex community. Barry Sampson is still a valued colleague at the University of Toronto, and in a way, we all feel part of a kind of enormously uh, fortunate extended family of multiple generations, and uh, we really feel that so lucky to have had the opportunity to have had many of these people as our, our critics, visiting critics, coming here, and then later on um, connecting with them after we graduated. So we started our practice in 1994. We had already built a few projects by moonlighting when we were working in other offices. Don't tell anyone. Um, and uh, I will, so what I wanted to do was share, first of all, some aspects that really shape our architecture. So I wanted to use a few images to talk about light, winter, water, the role of the section, materiality, and touch upon the scale of furniture and fittings. And then I wanted to share three built projects. Uh, one, the Integral House, which received a Governor General's Medal in 2012. The other, a really recent urban infill project, really small urban but never presented before that we're really excited about. And then a Taoist temple uh, that we received a Governor General's Medal for in 2016. Um, so really things that we haven't really ever presented in this form or together before. Um, and then I wanted to end with two works in progress, um, a, pine for a house in a pine forest in Moscow and the other on a beach on Oahu. Um, so kind of in a way it's interesting that for, for the first sort of um, 20 odd years of our practice, every project we did was within a three hour drive of our studio in Toronto. And in a way, everything was actually within this very local condition. Um, and now we're working in Toronto, but also in many other parts of the world. Um, so first of all, light matters. Um, so here's a study model for a synagogue we did in Portland, Maine. But the use of models, the study of light is critical. An interior view of the laneway house, a very urban condition. But the lay light recalibrates how light enters the space. This is a dining hall um, at Moreland's Camp where we used off-the-shelf greenhouse glazing combined with a glue lamp frame, metal tie rods, and then two by fours all down the middle to create a light monitor. And that's combined with, in effect, the greenhouse glazing which provides natural light and ventilation. So this is for a nonprofit charity that's been helping inner city children and youth since 1907. So in our climatic zone, we typically have to cover everything up with uh, so the, ins the structure's there, but it gets covered with insulation. So we were so happy to be able to do a seasonal building where the structure was revealed and exposed and really part of the experience. This is a project where we really bring the ravine inside through water jet leaf cut pattern of the black locust, which is found in one of the remnant ravines in Toronto. 
and in a way we're in the most northerly part of the Carolinian forest. So this space is really a tribute to the black locust. In the integral house, we wanted to use two types of wooden fins to really help us paint with light. We live at 43 degrees latitude, and this seasonal, this seasonal climate really forces you to think about how do you harness light as a force to continually recalibrate your understanding of what season you're in and what time of the day it is. Winter is a really long season. And so we revel in the ways that snow transforms our world. And we think about our designs through every season. And maybe it was those long walks from the main campus to Phillips Street that has embedded the impact of winter on us. Uh, this is a project early on called the Orchard House, which was a plywood tower, low stone wall in an existing apple orchard on a 30-foot grid. So we really asked our photographers to take photographs in the middle of snowstorms, and we are so grateful they still speak to us and continue to work with us. Um, we think about our buildings from the outside in, but also from the inside out, and we're really a very aware of the everyday aspects of daily life and how architecture can be part of that experience. So this is a view from the kitchen sink in winter. And we love to use water in the summer, in the winter. This is a very small courtyard in the laneway house where water is going all year round. Uh, this is a project, Ledbury Park, a public park where we designed an outdoor skating rink, an outdoor swimming pool, and a small urban ensemble in a very suburban neighborhood. And the use of winter water animates this public space. In the same project, we designed a weathering steel pedestrian bridge over a long reflecting pool that actually becomes a linear skating canal in the winter. So again, this kind of seasonal transformation of water. This is a view of the weathering steel house where in a way it talks so much about the power of winter water. And we appreciate water's ability to register subtle shifts of temperature, changes of state from ice to steam to mist so eloquently, and making what is normally invisible so visible and present in our daily lives. The same uh, view in the summer transformed again with a natural pond in the foreground with water lilies and fish and a swimming pool beyond. So this kind of way to celebrate the seasons and really be part of it. Um, the section. In school, we learned about sections, but in a way I feel as architects, section is a very um, underutilized but so important area. And plan is often so privileged and given so much authority, but for us the section is where the action is. Um, in 2014, as part of the Architecture Biennale, we were asked by the University of Venice as one of a few firms to, in effect, select sections from our projects and draw them really big. And in a way, this title, uh, Architecture Seen in Section, so we, we actually had to draw a whole series of our projects blowing up the section itself, and it was really for us um, really important to reflect on the role of this tool within our toolkit. Um, and just one of them was actually the Craven Road Studio. So very small project. The house itself was built in the uh, mid-90s and received a Governor General's Medal in 1999. It was low budget, urban infill in a Toronto back alley, um, clad in plywood. Ten years later, for the same client, we were asked to design a studio. And we used it as an experiment in light. So from the outside, it actually was um, for all intents and purposes, a garage. A garage has no side yard setbacks. Um, our client just happens to not own a car. Um, and so for $75,000, including rebuilding the neighbor's garage, we designed uh, the Craven Road Studio, which also received a Governor General's Medal for a space that is like maybe about 450 square feet. So it really shows you really don't need money to uh, have architecture. We used a very narrow skylight, as you saw in the section, and created a series of different walls of different thicknesses. So the narrow skylight amplifies the light through a series of wooden coffers, 
and that each wall is based on the orientation, uh, north, south, east, west, and the program. So behind all of those posters is the largest collection of architectural publications, and on the other side on the left is actually garden equipment, uh, wheelbarrows, and things like that. So in a, way, um, in a way, the section is for us really important and drives so much of our thinking. The questions of fabrication of materials and their eloquent assembly is an essential dimension of architecture. This is a 1994 photograph of Howard flame cutting the roof of the Garden Pavilion, our very first Governor General's Medal. And then a mock-up of the exterior cladding of the Weathering Steel House. So whenever you actually decide to not use a series of catalog pieces to create your building, you have to do 10 times as much work. And that we often use full-size mock-ups as a way to test and make sure that these things are right. And so here, this is in um, uh, the fabrication studio of uh, uh, Tremonte. Um, and Sam Tremonte was one of my students at the University of Toronto and has become a friend. And we have worked together for years. And that in a way, this use of materials that may be seemingly unconventional uh, for us is a really interesting part of what we like to experiment with and is kind of part of our ongoing exploration. Furniture. Um, often not thought, architects often just specify furniture and we like to make furniture. This is a chair called the Hab chair. So you're actually seeing it in the fabrication studios of Neon Camper who actually manufacture and distribute this chair. Uh, here are some plywood molds early on. We had designed a custom chair and we had to figure out how to shift it to a production chair. So here's actually the grouping, uh, and what we were interested in was creating a lounge chair in a sitting position where you could have a book, a cocktail, uh, and then also we wanted it to have a nice both backside as well as elevation. So this is actually in maple, but it comes in a variety of materials. We also love working with lighting. This is what we call our firefly lamps. So these are a kind of stainless steel mesh, and inside are actually cast pieces of resin that have a phosphorescent powder. So in a way, like fireflies that you catch at your cottage and put in a jar, uh, the minute the light goes off, the actual there's a, a 90 minute afterglow from this phosphorescent lamp. The question of craft in architecture is one that is quite elusive, especially in the age that we're in. Uh, but I actually think that we have so much amazing technology and uh, we uh, have really tried to exploit this to really provide another level of craft in our work. So this is a drawing by Howard of a door handle. And then it's turned into on the far left, plasticine, wood, and there are about two versions that are uh, 3D printed in plastic. And the last two on the right are 3D printed in bronze. And in a way, the kind of world of 3D printing just offers a level of customization and the ability for architects to actually intervene and not just be specifiers, but actually creators of content in a really different way. So I would say it's a really interesting and exciting time to both be an architect and an architecture student. This is a, a, a lamp, the, uh, the, the kind of pieces of a lamp that we call the whalebone lamp and in a way inspired by the kind of Inuit vertebrae carvings, um, but all of that is 3D printed in plastic. And so in a way, this is the lamp, and all of the kind of the light passes through the kind of uh, 3D printed plastic pieces. Um, so in a way, our very first project that we did in 1980-something uh, was actually a garden pavilion. So imagine your first project has a uh, ton and a half of rusting steel as the roof. It has no windows, no, no doors, and the only mechanical system is a pump that recirculates for a fountain. Uh, we were very lucky to work with the late Barbara Frum, and we actually realized a project that we actually didn't know at the time would have the kind of elements and the questions that we would keep asking ourselves for the rest of our career. So this shifting scale between architecture, landscape, and fittings, fixtures, was kind of embedded in our first project. Uh, the question of ruin and time, uh, so choosing materials that would actually evoke time and question our time in relation to uh, you know, geological time was actually very important. The use of many different types of materials coming together. 
thinking about um, the role of a retaining wall, a grade beam, this, this interplay between architecture and landscape, thinking about the, the line of the section that you create, what is a horizon line. So in a way, our first project is actually our current project, because all those questions that we asked 30 years ago, we still ask in every project that we do. So we had the project photographed 25 years after it was completed, and I would say maybe it looks more like what we imagined, nature taking over this kind of role and the tussle between built form and the role of these organic forces and the way that they come together is something that we, we actually like to engage in and think about a lot. So we assume our buildings will weather and age. We don't assume that they're white and perfect. And how they do and how the mark is actually left becomes a really interesting thing. Uh, so on the same property for the same client, so this is a project we've been working on for 30 years. No piece is very big, but the same, we're, we've just been experimenting and tinkering for a long time. Um, and then on the same property, we, des we designed a, a guest house. Um, and again, probably like about five, 600 square feet, uh, one room, but really also allowing a level of experimentation for us and thinking not only about buildings as objects, but buildings as frames to really understand and, and understand the landscape, creating a foreground to a found background. So this oscillation between foreground and background for us is really key. Um, and that inside this project, the kind of understanding of the scale of lighting and furniture, architecture and landscape all coming together. So, um, so what I'll do is go through fairly um, quickly three projects. The first, and so here you're seeing a section of a project we call the Integral House. Uh, so here, and you'll see, so this is the large scale section and as I go through it, hopefully you'll clue into different pieces of it as I move through. Uh, so this was designed for a remarkable person named James Stewart. I think a movie called The Integral Man is going to be launched in about two weeks. Uh, it had its first screening at Hot Docs. Um, and Jim was a mathematician, a concert violinist, and he loved architecture. He said uh, straight lines are boring, and so his brief was this project must have curves. Um, I wanted to actually have a concert hall for at least 200 of my closest friends, and it had to be architecturally significant. So that was kind of our marching orders, and here's an early sketch trying to think about, and in a way you can see some of our early work, we didn't have a curved line in it, so it required us scratching our heads and figuring out you know, how we would interpret curves, and, and not just curve as a line, but curve as a volume, because he was a calculus professor. So you couldn't just draw a line and get away with it. It had to be a volumetric representation of uh, curves. So here's an, a model that we did, one of many, many models at different scales, but this is the main living space. And uh, you can see that we use models a lot to really think through ideas. Some of them are really crappy, made of foam core and bits of tracing paper, and then they evolve over time. And here's some drawings and studies where you're looking at an upper level that has maybe 97 different fins and then the lower portion is a standardized fin. And we were using the fins as a kind of way of almost becoming an abstract forest for a building in a forest. Um, so here's a view of the 97 different fins. They were all numbered. We actually sent digital files to the mill workers. They then made the files, brought them back, and really using the computer as a really wonderful tool. Not So in our office, we don't do flybys. We don't do renderings with computers, but we actually do a lot of things in the fabrication area. So here we had a specification, and these are different fins created wooden fins created by different uh, uh, bidding subtrades, but you can start to see the light passing through. And then for the standardized fin, here's a mock-up of the shaped fin, and the glass comes in on either side, and then there's an EPE cap at the very top on the outside of the building. So here you can see um, it's a site on the Toronto Ravine, so the, the City's up here, and the site goes way down, down past the screen to here. And so it's a five-story building on one side and a two-story building on the other. And the section shows you that you enter at this upper level, descend a full floor into a double-height space, and descend further and further down the ravine, 
and there's one floor up is actually uh, bedrooms. So here's the uh, view from the ravine, which is really one of the signatures of Toronto. You can see the CN Tower over here. And here's a view of the project in the ravine in winter. So if you can hardly see it, we'll be really happy because we wanted it to become part of the landscape. And then this is a view from the street where you actually are reading a two-story building and these 97 different fins you actually start to see from the entry level and then above is actually etched convex and concave uh, pieces of etched glass. So you enter at this upper level and you still almost feel like you're part of the city and as you enter into the project you actually become part of the Toronto Ravine system. And so here is a kind of gathering of 200 of your closest friends sort of showing up at your house. And then here the stairs are like, like you're traversing a landscape. So they're switchback stairs. And we developed a whole language of the stairs using stainless steel mesh and cast bronze. And here you are viewing from one of the upper level living room balconies back to the stair in the entry. And then the main space, which is this kind of curvilinear space made up of these very different fins at this level, which is your entry level at the city, and then these standardized fins that become, in a way, part of your reference uh, of the ravine. So you feel like, even if you've never gone outside, you feel as if you've experienced a Toronto ravine. And in a way, in the winter, um, the whole place changes. And so as a cloud passes or as, you know, the weather shifts, uh, the building registers these subtle transformations. So you're always aware of these things that you might not be aware of if it was just a, a kind of big glass box. And then again, this kind of sense of descending down through the landscape and the kind of bringing together of different materials and really kind of being all, almost more outside than inside. So this kind of oscillation is something that we really love to play with and experiment with in all kinds of different ways. Uh, this is the lower level pool. There's a 35 foot window that actually drops into the ground. So when you're outside, you're really outside. And then a blue glass stair. And so our client, uh, Jim, asked us to really work on this uh, piece uh, with an artist, Mimi Gelman, and our structural engineers, uh, Blackwell, Blackwell. And so together we collaborated, and uh, so this is this pieces of hand-blown blue glass that are like shingles, a skylight above it. And in a way, this kind of piece has, you catch glimpses of it in different parts of the project. And then here's a view from the back where you're seeing a series of cast bronze uh, clips held up by stainless steel cables. So it's sort of uh, floating almost like a musical instrument. And we designed music stands. And it's been a place for contemporary dance, for different kinds of music. This is um, some musicians from the Simon Boulevard Orchestra. Philip Glass has played in the space. Um, and this is the Aldenburg connection, but really a place for gathering and connection. So quite different in scale is a very small project um, in Toronto. This is a really early study model that was done. Uh, this part of Yorkville has a series of north-south little uh, uh, passageways that are pedestrian only, and this project sits at one of those passageways. And then here is a view of it within the block. We had a really hard time from the heritage department at the city of Toronto because they thought these were heritage buildings and they gave us a really hard time. Um, so here's the built project and here you're standing on Yorkville Avenue looking north through one of these sort of combination laneway driveways, so at the project itself. And here you are further along, um, and so you're seeing it as part of this urban ensemble. And we were really excited to be able to create a really urban Toronto fabric building. And so we're using brick and steel as the material palette and really wanting to connect this building back to the city itself. 
So here it is in the kind of grouping of, and I think that all four were built at the same time, about 1970s. And here you're seeing in effect these, um, so we're actually, uh, there's a kind of outer, outer balcony railing here, uh, and then a kind of balcony, and then a double glazed uh, sealed units further inside. And so here you can see the grills creating the depth of these narrow balconies. And then when you enter from the floor, so the ground floor is retail, you come up one floor and you see the glimpse of a vertical stair that connects all of the different spaces in the building and a, and a skylight that brings light down to the middle. So it's very much a party wall condition with no side lighting whatsoever. And we really develop the language of the stair that actually becomes both circulation, but also, again, a different kind of transmitter of light uh, from the top to the bottom. So the, all of these are, uh, the, the um, uh, panels are actually all laser cut steel and we worked with the fabricators, different degrees of openness to solidity to get the right balance uh, for this project. And here's a view from the stair actually looking back at the two gaps uh, that connect you back to the city. The walls are all uh, cement board, so we actually used an exterior material for the interior walls. The uh, underside of the ceiling is Douglas fir decking, so the structure is the finished ceiling. And then a view from one of the offices looking back to that same laneway uh, that you came in on. So you're really allowing this kind of interplay between uh, the city on the outside and the building on the inside and the connection between the two. And the role of these deep uh, brick walls, fins, to really uh, create a sense of depth and plasticity in a building that is actually modern. So it's not an old building, it's a new building, but has qualities of the buildings of Toronto that we love, the robustness of these warehouse buildings made out of brick. So it's a tribute to the kind of building materials of our city. And then here's a view at the top where you can see these three large skylights and the top of the stair. And then connecting outside uh, back to the city, so an outdoor deck at the fourth floor. And then a view at night, getting a sense of it as part of this kind of urban ensemble. So then this next project is actually for a group of Taoists. So we learned that Taoism is one of the oldest religions in the world with Confucianism and Buddhism. Uh, and uh, Taoism is actually about uh, both chanting and prayer, as well as the art of Tai Chi. And so the physical act of Tai Chi is actually not exercise, but is actually part of their spirituality. And they wanted a space to be able to do both. So the site is really suburban. So we are at the top of Toronto and the bottom end of Markham. So this is Steeles Avenue. So you see suburban development below, cul-de-sacs, strip malls, gas stations, and this is actually our site, which was actually a single family residence. So what they initially did was they bought a single family house and they thought they could convert it, park in the back and all would be fine. And the neighbors went crazy and said, you can't do this. A place of worship has very strict parking requirements in the city of Toronto, uh, as well as Markham. Um, and so what we had to do was elevate the building. And uh, so what happened was we had a very little cardboard model in our studio showing this asymmetrical but balanced form. And they said single whip, which is actually a Tai Chi move. And they said the fact that it was this poised but asymmetrical form, they really loved. And so what it allowed was to create all the parking underneath, even though this group is kind of not like a church or a synagogue or a mosque. They don't come all on one day. They come in groups of 20. They come in and out. So we didn't actually need all the parking spaces, but we had to fulfill the parking requirements. And so it created this double cantilever. And so what's really interesting, is, so this is the front elevation that you see from Steeles Avenue. And then this is the double cantilever. So there's actually a 10.2 meter cantilever on this side and a 5.2 meter cantilever on the other. And one acts as the counterweight for the other. 
Uh, Dave Bowick of Blackwell was our structural engineer, and we've worked with him for the last 25 years. And uh, what happens is there's a raft foundation and a series of vertical um, cord-in-place concrete piers. So it's kind of a building that's kind of held, it shouldn't be hold, held up, but, it, but it's actually quite structurally sound. Um, and then what you get is you, you can park below or you can do Tai Chi, and then there's a place of worship up above. Um, and this is, and then here you are looking in the other direction, so you can actually see all of the concrete piers that is holding up the structure, and then the raft foundation, and then a detail of this edge condition, where we use a series of shaped weathering steel fins to actually create very large uh, windows uh, that bring light and natural ventilation in, and then you can see the parking area below. Sorry. Sorry. Um, so here's a view of the whole project where you can see the one cantilever and the other, uh, the structure, the stair bringing you up to the, to the main place of worship, a canopy signaling the front entrance, and there's a back stair that's exactly the same. Um, and in a way, what's happened in the summer is that they can have you know, 50 people doing Tai Chi on the hottest summer day underneath this, uh, this cantilever. And here's a view from the back. Um, and so uh, you can see, in effect, the property line, the neighbors on one side, the neighbors on the other, and then this kind of building floating in between. And here you are viewing it from the property line. And on the sides, we have uh, no windows. It's actually just clad in weathering steel. You can see all the structure. And on one side, there's an elevator bringing you up to the second floor. This is the outdoor terrace and the main entrance, and we created uh, structural glass openings, bringing light into the lower level. And here's a view at night where you can see the structural elements holding the building up, <clears throat> and everything is post-tensioned uh, concrete. And here's a view from below where you can see these glass openings and the vertical piers that are holding the structure up the main canopy, and then inside, uh, what was really uh, fun for us is that um, we actually used round off-the-shelf skylights and then created almost light monitors that actually bring light into the space in a, almost like a kind of constellation with a bright blue ceiling, and the light monitors are also um, holders for these large rings of incense. And so I don't know if you've been into any of the Taoist temples in Hong Kong or Macau, but they're full of smoke and they burn incense all the time. It's called the Wang Dai Sin Temple. So this is actually the statue of Wang Dai Sin. <clears throat> and so the kind of sense of atmospheric kind of smoke is incredible because the incense is actually a way of their showing their gratitude. Um, the walls are lined in a, a, a cedar, wire brush cedar, and the floors are all concrete. And here's another view of these kind of light monitors. And this is a memorial hall, which is where you honor your ancestors. So there are actually troughs filled with ash, and then you burn incense and leave uh, fruit to say thank you. Uh, so now I'm just going to show two projects that we've been working on but aren't finished. So definitely work in progress. Uh, and in a way, uh, they're in very different places. So as I said, when we first started, everything we built you could drive to, and now that's sort of not the case. Uh, this is a site plan showing, in effect, a piece of the property, which is over here. It's actually a parcel that used to be owned by the czars. It's an amazing pine forest. So this is what the forest looks like in the fall, and this is what that same forest looks like in the winter. It's actually a, the type of tree is a Scots pine, which, and we have Scots pine here, but they don't look like this. Uh, so as opposed to being bushy and wide, these are very tall and narrow. There's almost no understory in the forest, and in a way the forest was actually um, the inspiration for the project. The client had lived here for 
for about 40 years, loved the site, and said, I don't want you to take any tree down to build this huge house. And so part of it was snaking and weaving this program through this pine forest and uh, really, um, really respecting the trees as much as possible. So here's the project that sits right here on a large property. Um, partway through, they decided to build a lake. So there's a lake. We're designing pedestrian bridges, uh, the main building, accessory buildings. Um, and this is actually the Moscow River right along here. And all of this is the one, this amazing forest. And we started by a kind of early study model in a schematic design phase. And this model became the kind of beginning of the project, a series of terraces in the landscape. So whether it was indoor or outdoor, it would really feel like a series of terraces and porches was kind of the idea of the whole project. And so here's the early sketches where you're actually seeing the drawings of not just a living space, this dining room, but actually porches adjacent to it. So those, these indoor spaces are always next to outdoor spaces. And, um, and here's some study models of that same condition where there's a sense of interiority and a sense of exteriority right ne next to each other. And then using clear story light and different ways of shaping light to bring light into the project. Also, the, the sense that when you enter, you feel almost like you're more outside than inside. So uh, perspective drawings in the summer, and then perspective drawings of the same location in winter. So this kind of seasonal condition, and, uh, and also this sense of exteriority uh, while you're inside. Uh, senses of the porch where you're moving laterally along the building, winter water next to it, and this kind of feeling of being, being moving between inside and outside uh, all the way through. Uh, sectional models of a kind of gallery space where uh, we actually have uh, bronze friezes, uh, handmade uh, bricks from Denmark, uh, and glazing and roof canopies that straddle outside to inside. And here's a construction photo of it uh, uh, under construction, and uh, you're seeing all of the steel work that will be added to with the windows and the kind of uh, other elements. And then the elevation. It's a really long building. Uh, so this is the main part of the house. This is the walking connective piece, and there's a whole other uh, lower level. And this whole portion is inspired by the trees of the existing forest. Um, and so here you're seeing the plan. So you can actually see the main living space, this forest walk, um, a whole wellness area, and then a lower level portion. And here you can see the front elevation where there's a development of these uh, shaped bricks. And we were really interested in the idea of this low winter angle. It's about 53 degrees latitude. And so the, the role of winter light and the preciousness of it and being able to understand it through these shaped bricks. So we worked with a company called Pedersen Tegel in Jutland, uh, Denmark, and they, they worked with us to develop a custom shaped brick with several different shapes. Here's a study, full-size mock-up in our studio where you can see this kind of study. Uh, this is a, a mock-up on site uh, where we're looking at the kind of bricks themselves, and we have a series of horizontal weathering steel shelves and we like the fact that in the winter, these shells actually become where snow rests. And then the shaping of the brick allows the, the sort of low winter sun angles to actually become part of the experience of the house. So um, still under construction, a complicated process, but really interesting to be able to experiment with all these kinds of great materials. Some construction photos of the building, you can see that forest walk and the kind of linearity of it. Uh, a whole complicated team of people from all over the world working on it. And in a way, what happens is we have these kind of skylights where we have uh, wanted to make it feel like uh, pine needles on a forest floor. And so what you're actually seeing here is actually the shadow created on a regular day in this pine forest. Um, and so in the project, there are elements, uh, we actually are developing a frieze uh, out of uh, bronze based on the theme of the pine needles. And you can start to see this kind of 3D printed mock-up 
uh, studying, in effect, this freeze that will become part of both the inside and the outside of the project. So a shift from Moscow. So everyone in our, pro our studio wants to work in Hawaii, uh, which is this next project. Moscow is a bit of a harder sell. Um, so here we are. This is a series of leaves we picked up uh, from a native Hawaiian garden. And our project is on uh, the island of Oahu. Um, it's this beach that is right here has been voted the best beach, one of the 10 best beaches in the world. Uh, partly there are these amazing islands called the Mokaluas. It was part of a volcanic landscape uh, a long time ago. Um, and what's incredible is that you are between, in effect, the mountains and the islands. And that those are the kind of natural features that really position and frame your understanding of where you are. So these are the mountains, and they're shaped by the wind and the weather. So they almost look like a kind of stone curtain. <coughs> And then these kind of uh, magical islands in the distance. And the project is actually very geometrically based, and much of our work isn't so ge geometrically driven. But in a way, this rotation here is actually so that from the rooms of the project, you can see both the mountains and the islands at the same time. And it's actually going against the orthogonal perpendicular relationship to the neighborhood street and the shoreline and connecting you to these natural features that are cosmic. So here's a linear view of the project, long and thin, and everything is floating. So the roof is floating uh, above and everything is kind of hovering. And what we did is we put the main spaces of the project um, on the second floor and the bedrooms below. So we actually developed the floor by collecting beach, uh, uh, different, we figured out the different grains of sand on the beach, the <laughs> finest, the medium, the coarsest, and then we did some experiments, and then we created our own terrazzo that actually came from the beach. We actually looked at the kind of almost sense of an umbrella created by the kind of uh, leaf structure that we saw everywhere and looked at a series of experiments about what that upper umbrella should be and developed a series of bronze clips and kind of joint pieces and developed a kind of a whole roof system. And here's a kind of view of a mock-up. So this is the kind of big umbrella that, it, that everything sits underneath. They have a lot of spaces called lanais, which are covered outdoor spaces. And here are some perspectives looking at this big roof up above. Uh, we're working with an artist, uh, Richard Wright, to develop a kind of leaded glass light piece so that you're swimming in art and the water becomes this changing palette with the roof up above. And then, in a way, walking along, you connect to the islands and also to the mountains. So this kind of rotational condition allows you to be aware of things that you're currently unaware of. And then all throughout Hawaii, you see everyone wearing these Aloha Hawaiian shirts. They're everywhere. Uh, so this kind of idea of nature being embedded in everyday life. Um, so the lower level has a waffle slab. And we're very interested in this 60s kind of uh, use of structure through the waffle slab and wanted to develop one that was specific to this site and this place. So here are some early sketches. And then a kind of further development in plaster. And then understanding what happens when you multiply and create this additive condition. And then finally, this kind of, this is actually a stitched together version of a full size mock up that we're having done in a company uh, in Spring Valley, Ancaster, nearby. And they're actually working with us to create an ultra high str strength concrete uh, coffer that will become the kind of ceiling and the underside of, of uh, both the underside of the ceiling and then the lighting coffer. So you're st this is a reflected ceiling plan view uh, from the ground looking up. Um, 
So it's been a long evening and a really emotional one. Um, in closing, I just wanted to end um, at Phyllis Lambert's 90th birthday, and she's still going strong. She stated, so that's what's on her party bag right here. She said, you must put up a building which expresses the best of the society in which you live. And in a way, I feel like that is what um, we all have to be doing, and I think what our education at Waterloo really allowed us to do. Um, and for us, uh, uh, the striving to do the best that you can do is really important. Uh, the image on the right is Toronto City Hall. And um, I was just at a presentation for the Urban Land Institute, and Jennifer Kiesmat and uh, Kathleen Wynne were there, and at this panel I stated that we have been very busy building in Toronto, uh, but in a f and we have some great important modern landmarks like the City Hall from this 1945 to 65 period. But while we've been busy making construction, there's still very little architecture. And in a way, I think that it's a mission for all of us to continue to do our best to make more architecture. So I would say in closing, Howard and I think about our built environment through the lens of light, water, winter, the section and materiality. We love working at the scale of architecture, landscape, furniture, fixtures and fittings. And we truly believe that each scale is interrelated and participates in a rich spatial experience that oscillates between inside and outside. And we're committed to placemaking and connecting our human activities to mark the location where we gather together. And our architecture is inextricably linked to how we experience both nature and community simultaneously to reaffirm our humanness as people. Thank you so much.